Mukta, thank you very much for making the time uh, to join us. Now, one of the most interesting things that comes up when a person looks into your bio is this duality that you're living mm -hmm. in. Uh, on one leg uh, in the world of fashion, in another world, in a very structured engineering environment. Maybe before we get to how you actually live both of these lives, how did it come about that you have this duality? Um, I th think I've been lucky, just um, originally from Nigeria. Um, growing up in, in Lagos, I think one of the main things that was part of my culture was more about education. My parents were really big advocates about making sure that we were, you know, excelling in school. And um, so before I actually got into fashion, and I was on this path of just being an engineer, you know, I'm moving to America, going to a top engineering school. I actually went to Georgia Tech, graduated, yeah. and I worked for GE worked on you know jet engines so a proper engineering life pathway, yeah. Yeah. yeah and i think in 2014 13 i think when you get to your final year that's when you ask those critical questions yeah. what do i want to do yeah. why am i even in school what's my so passion? purpose becomes a big thing right? yes what's my yeah. contribution yeah. to the world and all of that yes so i think that's when i real i realized that and when i was working at ge i was very involved in you know, the internship, because I was actually working as an intern back then. I was, I was also the president for the intern. So I was involved in a lot of activities in the business in terms of making sure that we were able to explore different job functions. Mm. So I spoke with a lot of execs and they kept asking me the same question, like, oh, what do you want to do with your career goals? What do you see yourself in three years? And that's when I realized, like, wait, <laughs> I don't think I've ever really asked myself that yeah. question. So I think that's, um, and I went on like this year of just trying to really figure myself out, like, what do I really want to do? And uh, creativity just kind of like stumbled upon. I was one of those kids in the engineering class that kind of dress, doesn't necessarily look like the engineer, like the nerd. I was really fancy, you know, really cool clothes. The cool kid in the cool, class. Cool kid in the nerdy <laughs> class, This, you know. So I just, you know, just started like asking those questions and how was that yeah. experience, though, of taking the decision uh, to break away from something that not only you, but also your family mm -hmm. had invested in so many years? And I mean, and to go to uh, the U.S. is a huge accomplishment mm -hmm. for many, especially uh, at a, a tech of that particular caliber. Yeah. And, and deciding that actually I'm going to do me. Um, what was that decision making process like? It was hard. But at the same time, I think for me, I... I think I also grew up, and I think one of the main things was I felt like I've satisfied my parents. Okay, yeah. you graduated. And my mom calls it like, okay, just give me my trophy, which is my graduation <laughs> plaque. And I was like, okay, this is it. So box ticked. Box done. ticked. So right. now I can do whatever I want. And that's kind of like the idea of like, as long as you have good grades, you do good in yeah. school, you can have fun, you can explore, you can get whatever job you want. Yeah. So they, that was kind of like the idea of how my family yeah. structure was. So. When I decided, it wasn't, it wasn't easy because, you know, um, I actually didn't tell my parents I was thinking about it, but she kind of found out like, wait, are you really thinking about yeah. going into fashion after you just graduated with this, you know, good grades, go get a good job. But also when back then there was also the idea of like, you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to stop you. Just yeah. make sure you have stability. Yeah. And I listened to that advice more than anything. I was like, okay, if I even want to get into fashion design, I need to make sure that there's some type of income, I at least pursue my goals. And I'm big on not just having plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. I need to make sure that mm. I can move and like try different things as I move on. And then yeah. what does day one of a purpose driven life actually look like? So you've taken the huge decision. Yeah. Anybody who needs convincing has been convinced. Yeah. How, where do you start? And, and how did you start saying, this is the beginning of what I want to do for the rest of my life? What are the early days like? It was, um, it was hard, but exciting. Mm. Because the idea of not knowing was what kept pushing me. The idea of feeling like I didn't have all the information. Yeah. I'm very driven, I'm very hungry to learn more. And I think my passion is just learning. Mm. So as long as I had that, there was nothing that was gonna stop me from actually accomplishing the goals. And looking back three years, I didn't vision to be here. Yeah. But I knew I was gonna be somewhere that I wanted to be. I couldn't really visualize it, but yeah. I just knew that as long as I put the work into it yeah. and I roll my sleeves and I'm willing to learn, I'm that going to, figure I will out. figure itself out. Yeah. And you know, and that's kind of like what my mom always tells me, it's like, hey, it's not about, forget about the time, just 
you know, put your put your head down mm. and just work. And, and did you have mis you know, were there any misconceptions mm. that were cleared up for you once you got into uh, the fashion industry, standing on the outside <laughs> thinking this is what the industry must be like, and then once you're inside, was the reality of what you experienced the same with what you thought the industry would be like before you got in? Um, I think. I didn't know much about the industry because mm. I'm an engineer, so I was going in blindfolded. I, I had to learn, and not learning like I'm going to a fashion school, I had to learn from the outside. Yeah. You know, working every day, engineering job, and still having to, you know, kind of pay attention to what's going on. And I think for me, I had to, um, first of all, develop a taste of what I really like, yeah. what my style is, paying attention to what friends like to wear, what I like to wear, what my color palette is, and trying to define the brand. And then my first, I spent the first year not necessarily studying brands for how they, you know, for bit by bit to literally just replicate their brand, but actually understand idea of fashion design. And like, I, yes. how does Gucci have this immense, you know, design color palette? How do we keep their, you know, customers keep coming back? How can you separate Gucci from Louis Vuitton, yeah. from Ferragamo? So I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out design color palettes and like mm -hmm. how I can distinct myself. Then yeah. that's kind of like how my vision was, when I was learning about fashion, was what makes Gucci, Louis Vuitton stand apart from each yeah. other. And that's how I figured out, okay, this is what I want to make. This is the style of clothes I want to make. This is my vision. This is my story. This is what I think African designers are missing. This is the void. Yeah. This is my perspective. More than anything, it's not about me making something that I felt like was better than the other people. It yeah. was about what do I think the kids, the youth, I want. Yeah like right now. I love yeah. the how you speak about the void because yeah. essentially um, as an entrepreneur you're always trying to fill a gap in the mm -hmm. market and you want to make sure that there's demand yeah. uh, for that product or your, that service that you're bringing to market. Yeah. But having studied uh, all of these big uh, fashion houses mm -hmm. um, and you came up with something that is uniquely you but also relevant to the African context, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about your brand and, and, and how you've positioned yourself in the market. Um, why should anybody pay attention yeah. uh, to Mukta <laughs> instead of running to get the next Gucci bag? What's different? I think it's, it's unapologetically me, one. And two, the brand Visual Guys is really just finding the balance between my African heritage and my engineering concept and my exposure to what I've studied in America State. And um, I felt like I... For visual guys, my vision is to create a street luxury brand mm -hmm. that is made by an African for Africans, but it's universally appealing where you can go to any store around the world and you actually get this, you know, like I'm wearing my, my collection right now, actually where we show so like on Saturday. So talk us through some of the pieces yeah. that you're So I'm wearing, wearing like a, just a basic oversized shirt that's 100% cut and is really heavy cut in that you can wear literally every day. Amazing okay, fabrication. Um, I have like a linen that has a little bit of um, spandex in it just to give it a little bit of stretch. And one of my features is I like to use very simple 3D lines. Yeah. So I also wanted to create an aesthetic, you know, going back to the Gucci and um, um, Louis Vuitton concept, when you see a Louis Vuitton bag, you know, the print, when you see a Gucci brand, you see the red, mm. green, and um, so this becomes stripes. The that signature. This is my signature for my brand. So if you were to walk on the street and you see any brand that has this diagonal 3D lines, you know it's facial guys. So I wanted to create that cult of like a is, movement. Is of this engineering creeping into fashion? Yes. Uh, I, yes. I can almost feel yeah. the structural design elements yeah. coming through and manifesting uh, in a fashion piece, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. So that's what I try to do is to take engineering concept and apply that to design because that's where I come from a design perspective, but from a cultural perspective is filling the void, making sure that it's relatable to everyday people, mm. my friends, you know any young African designer, also making sure that I'm inspiring people through my work, that you can really just do whatever you want to do, and yeah. which is what Visual Guys is about, just inspiring others through innovation and creativity. So you speak about um, a luxury street fashion that's accessible around yeah. the world. Let's start at home. Yeah. Let's start on the African continent. Yeah. What is your uh, sense of the maturity uh, of the fashion industry in Africa? I mean, you've had the experience of being in yeah. the U.S. and no doubt have been exposed as mm -hmm. well uh, to other uh, big fashion brands. Yeah. Where are we, uh, we relative to the rest of the world? We're, I think Africa is exactly where it needs to be right now. I think we're 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 there because it's you know when we outside of fashion music is uh, Africa is hot right now not just for music for technology for infrastructure you know you can go on and on about 
all these big companies, top 50, 100 companies in America literally having come, you know, conferences, conversations about how to build and bring their product to Africa. So I think for fashion, fashion is exactly where it needs to be. It's just about getting our product out there more, mm. making it more accessible, figuring out logistics of how to export. Because mm. we have all the creativity, we have the textures, we have the culture, we have the design to actually create something that the entire world can consume. And we don't necessarily have to wait for the big brands to come in mm. to actually, you know, I guess people say marginalize the culture. Yeah. And create something, we can lead the culture and lead the effort in creating this movement, not just from a design perspective, but also actually texture perspective. Yeah. Because when you look at the wall, a lot of people love the African prints, yeah. they love the yeah. African textures. They say print the is the new black, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of opportunities there. You know, when you look into infrastructure as well, like production, like yeah. mill houses, you go to Ghana, they make all the Kenta fabrics. Exactly. So there's more that needs to come out. We just need to really focus on exporting the goods mm -hmm. to the world. And also from an e-commerce perspective, there needs to be a better structure on how people can not only consume clothes from overseas and actually export it, mm -hmm. but also be able to have people here be able to get, you know, clothes. And that's one of the, my vision for this collection is to make ready wear pieces yeah. that Hopefully, I can not just get into concept stores here locally, but figure out a way to actually create a, a system where I can actually ship and deliver pieces mm. around Africa. I love how yeah. you talk about e-commerce because I yeah. think to some extent this is uh, one of the opportunities that we haven't fully exploited yes. uh, in South Africa yeah. uh, and Africa yes. uh, more broadly. Before we go to break, very quickly, there's usually a very healthy tension between South Africa and Nigeria, uh -huh. right? Whether we are battling about whose GDP is bigger yeah, and yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. So whose fashion is better? <sighs> <laughs> Be honest, and you're in South Africa right now. <laughs> Come on, you know I have to go with the Nigerians, man. We, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm gonna switch in my, I'm gonna switch on my Nigerian mode right now. But I think we are obsessed with fashion. Yeah. I feel like every other friend that I know is amazingly good at not just making clothes, but actually amazing stylists. They have a vision that's like, I feel like every African culture. That's what we love to do. We love to dress and express ourselves. But I have to be patriotic. I'm sorry. Like Nigeria, I'm going with the country. <laughs> I'm not going to end up in line and be that guy. No, so there yeah. you have it. He doesn't want to be that guy. He's sticking to his guns and he's yeah. sticking by Nigeria's yeah. uh, fashion industry. And maybe South Africa's fashion industry still has a lot to learn. Uh, we are sitting down with uh, Mukta and he is, of course, uh, sharing with us this duality that he has in his life. Part engineer, former engineer, mm -hmm. and now uh, a leading player in the retail, uh, in the fashion space, rather, on the African continent. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we get to explore a little bit more around uh, Mukta's motivations, what drives him, and what's in store for his business going forward. Welcome back to Young Money. If you've just joined us, uh, we're sitting down with Mukta Onefade and his story has been nothing short of uh, inspirational. Uh, once engineer turned into a uh, fashion designer looking to redefine uh, luxury street af uh, fashion on the African continent. Uh, again, it's a pleasure uh, to, to be with you. So we've spoken a little bit about, um, you know, the shock of family and friends and mm -hmm. others who expected you to sort of mm -hmm. keep on this, uh, on this journey. But the fashion journey has started a couple of years uh, mm -hmm. for you now. And it might still be early days, but mm -hmm. it would be interesting to understand what have been your biggest learnings and lessons so far. Uh, that even in the few years that you've been in the space, you've like, there's so much that I've learned. I think I felt like within the last three years, I really understand myself more now. I think fashion is like, I guess like, are you, when I think about it, it's almost like a path to really just creating this 
person that I am. You know, you go through, I feel like I tell my friends sometimes, it's like sad some people go through two lifetimes and they don't really understand their purpose yeah. in life. And I think for me, I've, not just fashion, I just love to create and just think about ideas that can not just only benefit me, but also inspire others. And I mm. think I used to, when I first started, it was just about feeding the ego. Like, okay, I just want to make clothes and be cool. Yeah. But now I just realize there's always, the, there's somebody out there that's probably going to see my work and feel like they don't have the tools and resources to compete. And also being African, being an engineer, not having all the resources and knowledge about how to create, but to be able to be in that space that I was, you know, being in Detroit, working nine to five in an engineering job, but still be determined to say, okay, I really want to do this. and I'm not going to let my situation or my circumstance yeah. hold me back and yeah. make excuses and say, oh yeah, I wanted to get into fashion, but I was stuck working. And I think that's one of the biggest things is just perseverance and just determination mm. and patience because people expect things to happen overnight. You know, I've failed so many times. I think I'm here right now because I've perfected, quote unquote, perfected my failures. And every day is a learning curve for me. I mean, the runway show, that's my first ever runway show. It took me three years to get here. And What's it was the preparation like to put together a runway show? I mean, that must be insane. <sighs> it's a learn, I, I don't know what to expect or in terms of not know what to expect, but more like it was my first time. So I just really just focused on what got me here. Yeah. Like, you know, when I wanted to make the collection, I was, it wasn't about, okay, it's a fashion show now, go there and just create this crazy pieces. I had to define my purpose and what is the goal. Yeah. My goal is to make pieces that everybody can wear, ready to wear pieces. And after defining that, and it goes back to the engineering concept, it's like when we were working in, you know, we're in our little boardroom and we're trying to design or solve problems, like what's the definition that you have to, we come up, we, we have this, theory at GM, which is called like a Six Sigma. I don't know if you've yeah, heard of yeah, Six yeah, Sigma. Yeah. You know, you have to define, mm. develop. It's a whole framework, you know, There's a right? framework. Yeah. So that's kind of like how my thought process is when I'm creating anything is you define the problem, you look at your noise, your logistics, yeah. what are the options you have. And for me, it was like, okay, I'm making ready to wear clothes. What kind of fabrications do I want to do? What's the vision? How do I want my models to look? I want it to be free. I want everybody to sit there and look at the pieces and say, oh, wow, okay, I can wear that out. I want that right now. Mm. And that's kind of like the reaction I got. It was funny. Even the models were like, I'm going to walk away with your shirt right yeah, now. Yeah. And that was, a, you know, that was fulfilling for me to be able to think about that yeah. and to get that reaction that I was hoping for, which was just, wow, this is easy. I'm very comfortable. And that was my number one goal is how do I want the consumers to feel, which is comfort level is on the thousand level. Yeah. So that was like how I created the collection mm. for the wrong way. I, I want us to talk a little bit about uh, e-commerce and especially in the African context, uh, mm -hmm. Mukta, because we know that we need the infrastructure if e-commerce and, and uh, for retailers in particular is going mm -hmm. to take off in the way that we think that mm -hmm. it can. What are your views on where we are uh, in, in Africa and what can be done just to ensure that e-commerce takes off? Keeping in mind that there's still markets that are still very cash dependent mm -hmm. uh, in, in across markets in Africa. One of the things I think is technology. Like yeah. we all have mobile phones right now. It's just figuring out innovative ways to make sure that you can incite the consumers to actually want to purchase the goods, not just online, right on the fingertips. Mm. You know, um, also making sure that there's an infrastructure of when you think about like the, you know, logistical companies like the delivery companies like you know FedEx, yeah. UPS, yeah. and making sure that delivery is um, one of the like you know, when you look at consumers, that one of the biggest, I guess issues when you think about Africa from all these people are still kind of scared with the whole, like do I really want to order online yeah is it going to be delivered and I think making sure that the consumer experience from a delivery perspective is top-notch yeah. for one and also utilizing the technology that's out there mobile technology make creating apps for you you know for your brand having an online shop e-commerce site is clean effective and people can actually also not just purchase but also provide feedbacks on how you can improve your mm. customer relations and you know you have infrastructure like shopify that's out there yeah. that delivers to more than you know I don't know how many countries in the world, but from a business, when you think about the e-commerce structure, you think about the fashion industry, there needs to be higher power of people that can actually figure out a way to come up with a deal to be able to bring those ideas mm. and those structure to Africa. And if you think about, you know, GE and all these big companies, they're coming here to not just work in the electricity, building buildings, but um, 
from e-commerce perspective, I think online platform, we have to be able to figure out an infrastructure that works yeah. best with yeah. our system. Absolutely. Then incorporating different brands to start, you know, moving in that direction. And, you know, beta testing, having your top clients try things out, maybe your next collection that you you know people are really going to love yeah. and just make it only available online. Exactly. And maybe for the first two, three months and, you know, try to get people, you, you know, easily ease them into the idea of, okay, I really want this piece. I'm going to order online. And, okay, if it's okay, I, like, for example, my runway piece is just, I say, okay, it's available tomorrow online only, and I can get it to you within the next 24 hours. And they actually get it within 24 hours. I was like, wow, okay, I can actually get this guy's stuff online. I don't have to drive. They can deliver it to me. Yeah. Those are little, like, ways to entice people to kind of... And to change in, behavior, yeah, right? change and behavior. to change so like You have to give them an incentive, something mm. to bait them into that concept of... So as we wrap up, uh, yeah. I'm sure that uh, there are tons of entrepreneurs mm. watching, but also people who are just excited mm. by your pieces and the work that you do. So mm. if, how do they get a hold of them and where do they find you? Um, you can find me at Visual Gods, which is V-I-Z-U-V-L-G-V-D-S. And it's also V-I-Z-U-L-G-V-D-S at um, dot com. I'll say that again, I think I screwed it up. But it's um, www.vizuvlgvds.com, yeah. and it's at vizuvlgvds.com. All right, so yeah. we hope that uh, we get more people on the site uh, yeah. off the back of this interview. Yeah. Final question uh, for the entrepreneurs who are watching uh, tonight and uh, have ambitions of being uh, global and continental players uh, mm. in, in the fashion space. A uh, piece of advice that you probably want to leave with them. Be original and determined yeah. and make sure you inspire others. But there you have it. Be original, be determined. And if nothing else, remember that you are here to inspire others. It's been an amazing conversation uh, with my Nigerian brother who doesn't want <laughs> to admit that South African fashion is actually really doing well. But, uh, amazing, <laughs> amazing. But we <laughs> It's been a fantastic style. conversation yeah. uh, with uh, uh, Mukta. Thank you so much mm. for making the time to join Thank us you. and all Appreciate the best uh, you. as you move forward. Now remember that if you want the Young Money crew to come to you, it's really simple. All you're not got to do is just follow me on Twitter. It's at The Real Nosy or at CNBC Africa. And our hashtag is Young Money 410. Until next time, it's goodbye.